Hello, good evening, everybody. Welcome to day five of the MPS Talks 2021. This event is co-hosted by JetBrains and by Temis. And as I say every day, it's almost like a tradition now after these five days. Uh, it's kind of obvious for JetBrains because they're the developers of MPS and Itemis is kind of working with MPS a lot and has developed large part of the platform. So that's why we are co-organizing this together. Um, I should hint you, oh yeah, and my name is Markus Felder. Um, I should hint you to a post um, on the MPS blog where the JetBrains guys have clarified um, a couple of potential misunderstandings around web MPS. Um, Oscar is going to post the URL in the chat, but if you're aware of the MPS blog, you'll find the post there uh, as well at the very top. Um, and I suggest you check it out. Um, as every day, I want to uh, mention, ah, here's the link. Um, I want to mention that if you have questions, please type them into the uh, YouTube chat. I will collect them there and then ask them in a useful order um, towards the end of the presentation. Today is Systems Engineering Day. Um, in the past, we've seen, I mean, obviously lots of talks about frameworks, but also the example systems were mostly from business, from the business domain. Um, today, they are uh, from Systems Engineering. Our second talk will be by Florian Bock of Audi, or maybe one of the subsidiaries. There, things have changed there recently, but basically Audi. Um, and he's talking about um, a language for describing uh, driving scenarios for autonomous um, driving, um, well, basically training and testing. And our first talk today will be by Klaus Bilken. He works as a language engineering model systems engineering person, expert guy, Eddie Temis. <laughs> and he's going to talk about uh, Simbench, uh, a model-based tool for analyzing um, system resources and timing and uh, stuff like that. Welcome, Klaus. Uh, hello. Take it away. Okay. So, hello, everybody. Thanks, Markus, for the introduction. I'm uh, glad to be here. I just made it, I think, on the last day, so last chance. Um, okay. I will talk about uh, interactive model based resource analysis for systems engineers. Um, so, let's pretend we are systems engineers and want to. Uh, create some great new technical product. And um, we will tackle the, the challenges we have as system engineers here. And we build an MPS-based tool for this. And this is what I, what I will show today. Uh, so this is the agenda of the next hour. So first of all, I will give some motivation and, and show you uh, the challenge of the system systems engineer. And then we will look a, a little bit into the theory, how does the simulation work? Um, and I will uh, motivate why we want to have a spreadsheet-like user experience. Spreadsheet only in, in, in one way, not in the commonly thought of way. Then I will give you some background on our implementation. What are the ingredients there? Then we uh, look at the tool. I will give a demo. Then a little bit uh, behind the scenes uh, section and then a short wrap up. Okay, let's dive into it. Uh, let's uh, start with the systems engineers challenge. And as you all know, today's technical products are often embedded systems with lots of software. They are very feature rich and due to this increasingly complex. And uh, in addition to this, the cost per unit for the hardware is often limiting so that we don't have much headroom for developing our software. Um, so the question arises, and this is the one of the main challenges. So we we will build software components which run on this embedded hardware and will use the resources of the embedded hardware. And uh, will the hardware design be sufficient for all the software use cases? Will we have uh, enough memory, enough compute power, and so on? So there are lots of resources which we have to uh, look at. The problem is even worse because uh, in, in some markets like automotive, we have especially high volumes um, and this demands um, 
uh, uh, even more or uh, smaller per unit cost because yeah, you can save every euro, every dollar with each of these uh, devices. And if you build a million of them, then it uh, matters if you can uh, save one cent. Yeah? And this, again, reduces the available hardware resources and intensifies our challenge. Now the traditional approach would be you build some prototypes, so you have some hardware sample and implement some software and run it, and then do some measurements, and then you find out, okay, it will not work. So what what you do, what will you do then? Usually, this is too late. It would uh, induce a, a big pile of costs and additional development work. And so what we want to do is front loading. We want to do it early in the process. So basically we want to build a model of our system and then execute the model so simulate the model and this will allow us to to evaluate architecture decisions very early in the in the process we can validate timing requirements yeah, without implementing everything yeah. and uh, we can also find design flaws and fix them and even during the development we can find uh, optimizations and and test them on the simulator. Um, yeah, when we have the model and do the simulation and come back to the model again, looking at the results, this is usually a very fast cycle. So if you think about how the engineer works when building the real system, then this might take several minutes. You change your software, uh, build it, link it, flash it on the target system, test it, do the measurements. So this is, uh, not a fast process. And by doing this in the simulation, you can do it in a few seconds. And if we are lucky, even immediately, and we will see how this works later. Um, so what, what we aim at is an executable model with direct feedback. So now let's look into a little bit into how the simulation works. Um, this is the theory part, but it's just four or five slides. So it will be done soon. Um, so this is a very simple example. We are, we are always talking about consumers and resources. So consumers consume resources while they are going, while they are executing. And in this, this example, um, we see, to check that the mouse cursor is away, okay. In this example, we can see the, the time from left to right and the consumer P, which needs 100 milliseconds of resource R. The resource might be a CPU or a, uh, network or some uh, memory. Okay, so uh, what happens? So if there's no other consumer uh, on this resource, then it will take 100 milliseconds of wall clock time until uh, the resource uh, the resource activity is finished. And so after 100 milliseconds wall clock time, the consumer can proceed and do the next thing. Let's make it slightly more complicated. So here, our consumer P wants to access three different resources in parallel with three different amounts of, um, of resource action. So for R1, it uses 200 milliseconds. For R2, it uses 100 and R3, 300. And so as we can see, there's no other consumer. So after 300 milliseconds, the, lay, the last resource will be consumed. So everything is done after this period of time and it can continue with the next step. Let's look at uh, a sharing example. So now we have two consumers for the first time, Q and P. Yeah, they, they are running on the same system and using the same resource R. Every of, of them wants to have 100 milliseconds. So in total, it will take 200 milliseconds wall clock time if every uh, of of both consumers gets 50% of the resource. And we are applying a very simple scheduling scheme here. So just uh, give everybody the, the even share and then we can compute this. A little bit more complicated and then I think we are done for this. Um, so now Q still needs 100 and P now needs 200. And what we get now is uh, for the first 200 milliseconds, they have to share the resource until Q is satisfied. And then starting from 200 milliseconds, only P 
uh, uses the resource. So it takes another 100 milliseconds and then everything is done. Uh, what you can see here is that this period, so this, this point in time at 200 milliseconds is introduced by this combination. And this is important because we can, with our simulator, can jump from the zero point to the 200 point and then to the 300 point because in between nothing happens. They are consuming, but this is not interesting for the simulator. So as you might uh, have expected, we not only have two consumers, that would mean two processes on some system. Now we have many and we also have many resources. And so we get coupling from consumers to resources like, um, again, memory, net, network bandwidth, uh, processors. So this, um, this means this is a whole graph of coupled uh, entities. And there is one, one thing left I have to mention here. So on, when, when P and Q now work as they are expected to, then at one point in time, Q might need something from P, which is expressed as a logical dependency usually. And then P, uh, Q has to wait until P has finished uh, its step and then Q can continue. And this is a, a typical thing for this kind of systems that there are some dependencies which we also have to be able to model. Um, yeah, so I, I mentioned this already uh, quite often. So uh, the system is mostly in its steady state. So although the consumers are working and are doing something and also are using resources, nothing significantly changes in this period of time. The, the points in time where something changes is exactly at this uh, at this uh, points where some resource consumption ends and another one begins and so on. And this is why we called our simulator warp because it jumps from time step to time step. And if we are lucky, then even a complex system can be reduced to maybe a couple of hundred warps through time. And so the simulator can do its execution very quickly. Um, so this is a special case of discrete event simulation and typical applications of discrete event simulations are um, optimization of schedules, for example, in hospitals, production plans, or IT systems with servers and networks and tasks which are running, and also the resource consumption of embedded systems. And this is what we want to tackle here with, with the tool I will show today. Um, so, um, so I already mentioned that this, this cycle of changing the model and looking at the results can be quite quick. And as we have seen just now, the simulator can be fast because it can warp through time from one point in time to another. Um, so what if we avoid the generate build step at all and do this in an interactive way? And we know how such interactive tools uh, are working by looking at the spreadsheet examples. So here we have a, a dis distinction between user content and computed content, which you, you can express by, by filling a formula in a cell. And then the user change leads to immediate updates. And this kind of liveness uh, is what we want to achieve with the tool uh, Simbench. Okay, now a couple of, of details about the implementation. So first of all, let's zoom out. This is the, the technology stack we are using here. So on the very bottom, obviously MPS, and then we have the usual extensions and embedder platform. And then on top of this, we are using the IAT3 open source, especially the big kernel F part, together with the interpreter and the, the expression language. And then on top of this, we have IAT3 core, which has a couple of uh, subcomponents which we are using here. So one is uh, variability, one is components, uh, component language, then the, the warp simulator and uh, the Simbench tooling itself. Now let's, let's take a closer look on the warp Simbench part. Um, so uh, if you look at the left side of this diagram, you can see how we currently implemented it. So Simbench 
is a, a couple of, of DSLs, a couple of languages implemented in MTS. And warp is an external library, a jar file. Uh, actually, xwarp is an open source engine, which is available on, on GitHub. I put the link there. And it's uh, we implemented it using Xtent, the Xtent language. So what we get there is a Java uh, library, which we can use here. And, and this mapping from the Simbench model to xwarp is done with plain Java code. Yeah. Um, so we didn't use a, a generator here or some model transformation. We just access the API of, of the simulator to be fast and to, to get it running uh, in, in an interactive way. And on the other hand, um, we will get results from the simulation and we'll, we will uh, lift them back into the model. Um, Meanwhile, um, after we have built this uh, solution on the left-hand side, we built this Warp DSL, which is a low-level language uh, which can be used to, to use Warp directly. And so, as is indicated by the different levels of blue boxes, so the, the abstraction level of Warp is much lower. And there are this additional functionality in Simbench, which we don't have in this Warp DSL. But we have built this to be able to build customer-specific DSLs for systems engineering and to uh, map them to Warp. And we actually did this in customer projects. So um, Simbench doesn't apply a SysML standard, for example. So if a customer wants to model with SysML, we would build this and uh, map it to, to warp, um, maybe losing the this interactive property of what we have with Simbench. But yeah, we would choose uh, the MPS generator framework, or we could use uh, an incremental model transformation like shadow models, so that this uh, the, the warp DSL is, is uh, available all the time. And then we can also implement uh, this, this interactive user interaction. And this is what we will do in the future. So it's planned to also build uh, a new Simbench based on the same principle. So uh, using this, the Simbench models, uh, transforming them with shadow models in an incremental way, and then doing this interactive um, mapping to the simulation engine. What we also use is uh, product line variability because if you invest a lot in such kind of executable models, you don't like to build a new model for every variant or every product instance. Instead, you, you want to build this 150% model, which can be applied to many of your products. And this is what we are doing here. I will not go into detail here, but this, this shows the, the idea. So we're using feature models and configurations for all kinds of, of product instances. In this case, the product is the executable model, which is built by the system engineer. Um, some more implementation aspects. So what Simbench uses is the, uh, the hierarchical component language, which is provided by IT3. Uh, in the screenshot, you can see uh, uh, the, the graphical projection using the, the graphical editor. Um, we use this for, for modeling hardware and software uh, architecture. And then there is a partitioning or deployment model which connects both. We are using kernel F for arithmetic uh, and Boolean expressions. And we are using the interpreter of kernel F um, for evaluating these. And this has to be done during this interactive cycle because uh, we have to give something to the simulator and then we have to evaluate it first. Um, I already mentioned the lifting of simulation results. So the simulator produces lots of results, and some are projected directly into the model, and some are accumulated, and we can build some kind of Gantt charts from it. Here we are using JFree chart, which is somehow limited, but at least it's a, a nice demo. Um, in in real world uh, tools, we we have built other things which are not part of, of Simbench. Yeah. OK, now we are uh, 
the, the tool demo is about to start. I want to give you an impression about the, the application domain for the example I'm using during the demo. But I think due to copyright issues, I'm not to I'm not allowed to put some diagram or some some picture of it here. But I I uh, think we can do a little um, a little questionnaire so that this will be selected by chance. And uh, I'm I don't have any copyright issues. So I prepared three domain examples and. Those have the the ID M P and S, and when I when I now say go, uh, the, you you pick one of those letters and put it into the chat, and Marcus then hopefully who will help me will uh, look at the first five of them and pick the one which has been uh, uh, put in the chat most. So if there are three P's, then I will click on this domain example P. Yeah. So go. All right, I'm watching the chat. Did anybody put uh, in a letter? Yes, stuff is happening. Stuff is happening. Mm -hmm. All right, we're at a tie. S wins. S wins. Okay. Yes, I S will wins. click. <laughs> I didn't quite understand this copyright thing and how your 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 thing here helps with that, but as long as you're happy, I guess we're happy. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I I right. let's let's click on it. Uh takes the time to open the link. Okay, so it's Audi. Yeah, I, I didn't want to to take this picture and put it into the presentation because I'm I'm not obliged to take a, an arbitrary picture and put it into this public presentation. But now the, we all choose together that we look at this Audi website. So this is the the um, device which we want to to build in our example. So it's an infotainment system with navigation system and uh, phone connection, and uh, it can be can it has nice graphics and uh you can you can use it by touch screen or head up display and so on and yeah this is a state of the art infotainment system and now we are pretending to be the systems engineer who who wants to build this kind kind of system okay i i already mentioned so we the system will will need some some kind of graphics subsystem and yeah this is a part of our software model. Um, and this software model consists of a hierarchy of functional components. And this is one of those components, the graphics component. And what we can do here with this with the SimBench tool is to add this Sim section. And this section will uh, specify what the component does in a certain use case. So our use case we are modeling here is the the power up use case so you get into the car switch it on and then the graphics component will run through this sequence of steps we are not interested in the actual uh, activity after the startup because the startup is our critical scenario right now and we we'll look into it and so what we have modeled here is that the first thing this component has to do is to uh, read the the image, the executable from some flash memory, and this is the size of the executable, dot eight megabytes, and then it has to do some computation, some initialization of seventy milliseconds here, and after this has been done, so both of these actions will run in parallel. The image loaded step is ready. Next. Um, we will try to to uh, reach the available state and in order to do this we have to do some synchronization with the graphics hardware which is basically polling and waiting for for some interrupts or whatever and some more uh, computing so these uh, use statements uh, specify uh, the the amount of compute time we need for this step yeah and and after those two steps the graphics uh, will be available and, and something can be shown on the screen. Yeah. 
Now, um, our system contains of many components, so not only of this graphics, uh, but maybe 50 other components. So I think in this example, it's about 30 to 35. In the real world system, you will have a couple of hundreds of components. Okay, but now we want to understand um, how this would work in real time. So let's put this on the right hand side and let's look at, at this item here. So what we see here is a overall system description um, where we specify the, the functional root, which is the root of our software tree and one components in this tree will be this graphics component we see on this side. So what we can do now is activate the simulator. Um, now, we can see that it's activated because we, we get this active simulation uh, cell which shows how long the simulation actually took and how many iterations, how many time warps we, we had during this. But let's look at the at the graphics component first. So what we can see now is a uh, the simulation results which are projected into this model, and we can see that only after a little more than one thousand milliseconds, so one second, the image loaded step is done. So the executable is there and can be run, and then it takes another three hundred milliseconds until the system is up and running. Um, yeah, why is this? So we can play around a little. So for example, let's pretend that we don't have to load the image. So I just uh, comment this this line. And what you see is that for, for reading, uh, for executing 70 milliseconds of CPU time, we need nearly 700 milliseconds of wall clock time, which means there are about 10 components running in parallel. And this is clear because our system doesn't only consist of graphics, but it consists also of many other things which have to be started, like uh, the, the connections to other systems and also diagnostics and many things. Um, so let's use this again. And you see, I can do changes and see immediately what the, uh, what the results are because now the, the simulator is in the active state. And as I, I'm, I'm used to with spreadsheets, I get immediate reactions from my system. And this is a really nice property because now a system engineer can work with it uh, and can do experiments and get live uh, responses. So now let's, let's try to achieve some goal here. Um, Ah, what we also what I also want to show here is this this little Gantt chart here. The the screen resolution is now much too too uh, small to see everything, but so that you can you can open up this resource load diagram on a second screen, and now you see the time on the x axis, and you can find out, um, for example, here. Yeah, exactly 10 components are active in the early phase. And one of those components, the second one is our graphics uh, image loaded step. Yeah. And you can also see the, the flash activity. So three components are in, in parallel loading data from this flash uh, memory. Now we can think about optimization things. So, but first of all, let's get the requirements right. and. Um, yeah, as I already mentioned, we are looking at the startup scenario, and this is specified here, yeah, the basic startup scenario. And if I jump there, you can see that uh, the scenario is just a collection of use cases. So in our case, it's just one use case, which is system startup, but I, but I could add other use cases like low battery or uh, compute a long navigation route and things like that. So you can combine use cases arbitrarily to to execute other scenarios. And this is very useful because by combining these, uh, so you build each use case uh, separately, but then you can combine them in a declarative way. And what we see here now is a, is a list of, of semi-formal requirements. So um, 
the thing is, if you build a system like this, you will get tons of requirements and only a certain percentage will be um, related to system aspects like timing, performance and so on. And the systems engineer has to get these and then make sure that they will all work out, that they will be all satisfied. And what he can do now is to, to put them into the tool in a semi-formal way so that the tool can check against the simulation results if the requirements are fulfilled or not. And one of the requirements is, is this one, which refers to our graphics available step. So you can see here, this is graphics available. This is mentioned here and the requirement says, the milestone graphics available shall be reached until 1200 milliseconds. And this is because we want to show a splash screen. And if you sit into the car and then uh, turn the key, you want to see the splash screen immediately, but not later than uh, 1.2 seconds. And there are actually legal requirements, not for the splash screen, but for other things, which have to be fulfilled in different countries. And what we can see here, um, is the this this requirement is not met by, the, by our system, so we we have to optimize it uh, by 105 milliseconds, and then we are right at the at the maximum which is allowed. But we can try to do this. So what could we do? So one thing is we could convince the customer that this uh, requirement is is too too restrictive, and we could tell him. Oh, why not? Why not choose one and a half seconds? Obviously, this will this will now the requirement is matched because we we made the requirement less aggressive. But um, I can tell you this can be done only in a very small percentage of cases. So let's go back to one thousand two hundred and look at the at the implementation, which is currently our model. So what could we do? So one thing is we could talk to the developers and tell them, see, 70 milliseconds is too slow. Yeah? You have to be able to do it in 50. Yeah? And then we can see, OK, it's green. Yeah? Because now we are below uh, 1,200. But the developer will say, um, well, I cannot do this. It's too complex code or it's safety critical i will not i will not change anything so let's let's look for something else so maybe we can achieve some optimizations in the executable image and maybe they forgot to to remove the debug information and then we can say okay we can optimize this 1.6 um but we can see it's still not enough yeah? we we didn't achieve to the the one 1200 so let's forget about this. And now let's look at a third optimization, which is um, maybe a little bit more interesting. And this is the following. So if, if we are looking at this uh, Gantt chart we did before, we saw there are 10 components running in parallel. And maybe for some of the components, it's not even necessary to run this early. So we could introduce an uh, artificial dependency to to remove them from the early phase so that the graphics driver will get more CPU power. And let's do this. I, I prepared this um, a little bit. Let me find it. So here we have some navigation engine component, which is not, not really, uh, well, it's the map. Yeah. So we could argue the navigation map, which is the component which shows the uh, map. It cannot do anything without the graphics. So why start it before the graphics is even available? And so what we could do is introduce some precondition, which says don't start this step before graphics uh, or unless graphics is available. And now if I put it into the model, you can see that the uh, the starting point of navigation will go uh, will be worse, uh, but we now meet the requirement. And this is a typical kind of optimization which uh, engineers find with, with this tool. Yeah, right, um, uh, doing this testing. And if you want to do it in a real software, then you ha somehow have to, to, to build in the dependency from graphics driver to navigation, which might be hard 
to do just for experimental reasons. So if you, um, uh, here you can, you can at least try in advance if it uh, makes sense to do this. Yeah. Okay, so um, this was the little playing around and, and showing how the tool can be used. Now let's look uh, briefly at the uh, variability part of it. So here we want to be able to model a whole family of products and not just the, the one we are, we are looking at. And this also can be done by by building or by providing these feature models. And one thing we could switch here uh, might be the mapping from uh, consumers to processors. So for example, the HMI component currently, so let's, let's look at the HMI component um, that you can see the timing here. Okay, so you can see this. This is the human inter the the human machine interface, which shows all the buttons and the menus, and which handles the 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 joystick or touch screen and all this stuff. And you can see, so it's very slow. So only after nine seconds you can you can interact with your system in the car. So you you paid thousands of euros for for this nice system, and you have to wait nine seconds. Yeah. So 20 years ago, you just switched it on and the radio started playing and, and uh, here it's different. Okay, so we want to optimize this and uh, in, in order to, to test uh, different optimization uh, possibilities, we could, for example, uh, assume we have, a, we have a second CPU. And so um, here we have two mappings. So one mapping says, okay, the HMI is mapped on the main CPU or the HMI is mapped on the secondary CPU. And now let's switch it on by switching on the, the additional CPU feature. So this is the presence condition um, and can be used to, to do changes in the model. Now I have to find the, uh, the configuration. So here we have the configuration where we can simply pick some features. And as you see here, this optimization additional CPU is not active right now. And now let me let me activate it. Um, yeah, and now you can see by putting the, the HMI process on a different CPU, we are five seconds faster. Yeah. We have to look into the details here, but so this would be a typical use case for, for using this interactivity. Um, we just assume additional CPU and then we can test what the impact would be. As I mentioned, every cent counts, so it's probably too expensive. But if there is no other way to, to uh, satisfy all the requirements, then this will be a, a final step which will be done. Okay, one thing I didn't mention before, and this is the last thing I will show during the demo, is the, the reality check. So how do we know that the simulation does exactly what we what the real system will do? And this is especially important um, when, uh, when there are actually real systems. So in this early phase, when the system engineer starts with his work, it's yeah, there's no real world thing which can be uh, compared to. But later on, we want to know there is a, an early prototype. Will it fit to this? And um, th this is a, a very important question. And I will show you what can be done uh, here or what we have done. So typically in these time critical systems, you have something which is called KPI, so key performance indicator. And this, it defines that uh, at a certain point in the in the system lifetime or startup cycle, um, yeah, this has to be reached after a defin uh, defined period of time. And what we can do here now is to relate these KPIs, these points in time, uh, to external log files. 
So if we have a real system, we can run it, get a log file, and we will find some timestamps in there, and we want to compute them to, to this model. And this can be done by, by these this markers. And what, what we have here is a, a regular expression, which uses the uh, regular expression language, which comes with MPS. And then we have a tool which, which reads the external log file and finds this regular expression, extracts the timestamp, and compares it to, the, uh, to this model. And what we see here is the, the reality is about 10 and a half seconds for this key performance indicator. And our simulator is too fast. So either we have some, some regression in the real world software, or our simulator is too optimistic. Uh, we don't know, but um, this is an important information. And this uh, will be done all the time for each sample, because we want to, uh, with the simulator, we want to be ahead of the actual development. And this can only be done if, if all the, the parts of the model are correct. OK, for the last couple of minutes, I will switch back to the presentation. And I have some more slides uh, about some details behind the scenes. So um, here is a uh, list of some examples we uh, we did for, for the Simbench applications, especially for this infotainment world. Um, uh, yeah, I won't go through this list. Yeah. It's just some complex problems which you usually find in building these complex embedded products. Um, then I want to mention some challenges, and this is especially interesting uh, regarding the presentation of results. So as you might imagine, the simulator provides a lot of data. And um, uh, parts of this data we are currently lifting. These were all these yellow boxes with timings and also what we shown in the in the requirements and so on but there's much more data for example the critical path of the system or the resource load over time and all this is interesting but you have to build a lot of ui and uh, maybe new languages for representing the results and we um, doing this with a slow pace um, and one uh, other problem with this lifting is that the mapping from the simulator results to the system model is not unique. So one thing uh, which comes up for everyone who builds a component model is that the instant that a component might be instantiated several times, and then you have to know uh, which of the instances you are looking at. And another similar problem is that if you have a behavior which runs multiple times, then you want to know which data you are looking at. You're looking at the fifth run or the seventh run and so on. And this makes the, the UI very complex to, to present all this to the user. Um, you also, this is the last topic here, you want to compare multiple simulation runs, maybe change a feature and then look at multiple simulation runs side by side or do some algorithmic analysis. Um, this is also, we, we built some, some tools in, in customer specific uh, solutions for, for this, but there's no generic solution here. Okay, I think I will skip this one and, and go to the wrap up now. So um, what I have shown you during the, during the last uh, 45 minutes is a tool built with MPS, which can be used for modeling executable systems and doing simulations to find out timing, resource usage, and so on. And the important point uh, in this presentation was this interactivity that we can achieve a feeling like working with a spreadsheet. You choose something and you immediately get a reaction. And this uh, supports this design space exploration, which uh, systems engineers love. I also mentioned briefly the product line variability support and also the, the reporting of results to the user, um, where we still have to, to do some work to do this convincingly. Um, there's a long list of ideas for the future. Um, the first one I mentioned already, so 
we want to use incremental model transformations and map it on this intermediate language to be more flexible. And also there were some functionality extensions of the warp simulator, which are not uh, supported by the SimBench yet. Um, and obviously uh, system engineers also would like to work in the browser. And so Modelix, and this would be a, a good example for, for prototyping with Modelix. And I think I mentioned uh, most of them. Maybe yeah, there, there are several domain-specific analysis possibilities like automatic optimizations or find the set of features which provides the most performance system, things like that. Um, yeah, and many more ideas. OK, we are not running out of work, but we're running out of time. So thanks for your attention. Well. Thank you, close for the talk. Very interesting. Um, there are questions, but first, uh, a few comments. First of all, as uh, suspected, darkness has indeed descended on Stuttgart as a consequence of your presentation. Um, <laughs> OK. Uh, Might be second, related to the time. time yeah, yeah, possible. Po it's correlation. Possible. You never know. Yeah, yeah. You know? <laughs> um, um, the second thing, um, I what I really like about I mean, I've, I know uh, Simbench, I've seen it before. But what I like is that it demonstrates how a modeling tool, and in particular MPS, can be used without any code generation or execution, right? Lots of DSLs we've been build, building, we as, as, as ITMS, but also the community, are intended for running, for writing programs that run. You did something completely different. And I think it's very interesting to, to see that um, in action. All right. Um, before we... Um, come to the questions uh, i'd like to once again remind everybody to to like the video if they if they enjoyed it um and uh, now we, we get to the question the first question is as you can probably guess by federico he says maybe i missed <laughs> i missed that part um but it's not clear to me how the warp oh shit, ah, how the warp works how the system figures out which time to simulate Okay, uh, I explained a little bit about the theory in the beginning, and Warp will use this theory to fi find out the timings. So what it does is start at the at the beginning and then compute from all the resource needs it knows at this specific point in time. It computes the point in time, the next point in time where something changes, and then it warps to that point. And then it does the same again. And this iterates until it's running out of new events. OK. Sophia asks, if you're abstracting the simulation results at the model level, do you have any way of proof that this abstraction is correct? Or are there any experiment results to validate this? I think you, you uh, get got to that with your markers and log files, right? Yeah, right, right, yeah. Okay. So This question um, was asked earlier. Yeah, yeah. So again, Federico, why did you use Extend? Any particular reason? Actually, there was a, a initial implementation of this uh, warp simulator using C++ because we were thinking at the beginning that we have to be fast to do these quick uh, cycles. But the, after all, it was a pain because we had to use the Java native interface. And so the choice was to, to switch to a different language which is running on the JVM. And as I was fluent with Extend at that time, I chose to, to use Extend. What would you choose today? Probably Java in a later version. Mm. I'm sure Federico is hoping for Kotlin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. So Sophia again, which part of SysML, uh, of the SysML-like language was used for the domain? Um, yeah, well, blocks and and block parts and ports. So this would be the the typical choice to to represent the structural hierarchy. Yeah, yeah. it's what everybody. It's the it's the five percent of uh, SysML that everybody uses. Right. Yeah. It's also, by the way, worth um, uh, mentioning that uh, we did build just because we talked about systems engineering. We did build a prototype of SysML two in MPS. Um, it's not production ready, um, but if people are interested for some reason, ping us. It's it's uh, 
interesting combination of a standard like SysML and the ability to use MPS to extend that in domain-specific ways to build language abstractions on top of SysML, kind of like we did with Embedder and C. Anyway, this is just a diversion. Um, Vladislav uh, has kindly switched to uh, non-Kyrillic fonts today, so I can I, I, <laughs> I did I would have remembered the name, but anyway, thank you. So, what's the point in simulating discrete resource consumptions? Is an exact solution not computable? Um, well, so it's a good question. So, uh, what you could do is to have uh, this kind of of probabilities for all the values. Uh, and there are ac actually simulators which can do this. So you put in probabilities and what you get out are also probabilities. So with and probability, you mean a, a distribution of memory. Exactly. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Um, so this would be, maybe this, this uh, already answered the question, but the question was also uh, the exact solution. Yeah. And I think this is, on the one hand, it's difficult because if the simulation is is doing several hundred steps with hundreds of components, then it's there's no there's no closed formula for this. And yeah. also, if you're doing this in this early phase, uh, you will not get a hundred percent accurate result anyway, because all the numbers you put in they are just estimates, yeah. or you you extrapolated them from an earlier project or something like this. And so you get off the real value, maybe 10% plus minus. And so it's um, yeah, no use of doing the exact computation there. Yeah. And I think when we talked about this before, you, you said that the point of this tool is to give the engineer a way to estimate early in the design phase when there aren't any concrete numbers. But as the system evolves and concrete numbers are available like actual memory that's been you know welded into the hardware and stuff then you would replace these estimates with actual measurements and so over time you're getting more and more representative of the actual system that's right but there is a but mm -hmm. um, you you have to abstract also from hardware properties for example so mm -hmm. if you are modeling a hard disk we are doing this by a couple of numbers right now yeah. because benchmarks have shown that uh, these couple of numbers is sufficient to achieve a certain uh, accuracy. But if you want to uh, bring in the latest knowledge of optimized hard disks, then this is not enough. You need a much mm. better detailed model of this and you, you will not build it in, in this kind of tool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, another uh, thing worth mentioning may be why you have chosen to do these rather rough estimates uh, as opposed to do it more precisely is that you can run it fast to get this interactive user experience. Yeah, exactly. Um, Julian is asking an interesting question. Um, uh, <laughs> when the user input changes, e.g. you change the splash screen size, how does the simulation get updated immediately? I expect to have pressed the generate button in MPS each time. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So what we did there is to use a checking rule. So this is a technical solution. And the checking rule has a quick fix. And the quick fix runs the simulator and lifts the results. And then automatically MPS will update the editors. So we don't need any generation step because this is done just by the Java code, which does the mapping to the simulator. Yeah. Yeah, again, I, I think this is exactly why your your talk uh, is so interesting because it does not uh, execute programs in the classical sense. It doesn't generate, um, and it highlights that you can do things with models that are you know that are different from pressing Control or Command F nine and generating a bunch mm -hmm. of Java, which you then compile. So yeah. very very nice. Um, Sophia asks, how can you justify this DSL development as opposed to using SysML with simulation happening on Cameo Systems Modeler? So the we are using this, or this tool is used in a very early stage when you don't know all the details. And I don't know if, if Cameo Systems Modeler can do this. But uh, usually the, the big commercial simulation tools, they will um, need some C code, which is emulated on some emulated hardware. And this is uh, not what we do here. Hmm. 
Also, I mean, the argument of building a DSL as opposed to uh, using a big fat commercial tool is often that it's a tailor-made solution for a particular problem. It's more easily adaptable and so on. So there's lots of yeah. kind of non-functional trade-offs that are also worth considering. All right. So, uh, and Sophia replies, yes, but it can be hard to learn it. And so, yeah, that's the general trade of a DSL. You get something more specific, but you might have to learn it. I mean... Yeah. And and this is why I, I also had this this little architecture diagram where where I stated that we are building the DSL which the customer needs to to model his systems and it might be very system ish but yeah. it might be also different. Yeah, yeah. It is it is not like everybody who builds systems is completely buying into using system L. It's not, it's not like mm -hmm. maybe it will be like that in the future, but right now it's not like that. Okay, so we're out of questions. We have four more minutes. Uh, you might uh, bring out your piano and play uh, us a little bit uh, a song, or should we continue with the next talk? Uh, better continue with the next talk, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Klaus. Okay, my pleasure. Okay, so... Um, Florian, are you there? Yes, okay, I can see yes, you. Yes, I'm there. I hope you can hear me as well. Yes, I can hear you. You seem to be in a, an Apple store. <laughs> Not really. So it's <laughs> a living room with 20 computers. <laughs> yeah, seems so. Okay. All right. Good. All right. I already uh, mentioned, uh, kind of introduced your talk at the beginning of our uh, session today. Um, so I'm not going to repeat it. So mm -hmm. go ahead. Enjoy. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so my name is Florian Bock. I'm a senior software engineer at the car software organization. So, and now the first question is, what is the car software organization? Uh, it's a newly founded software development company uh, based in the Volkswagen group. So uh, many of the software development topics from, for example, Audi or Porsche have been moved to this new company. And so have I. Um, and therefore, um, both the information that this talk is up from Audi and from car software organization is correct. So um, today I want to present you both the um, background and the motivation of our scenario modeling language, Steve, and also a live demonstration directly in MPS. Um, Steve is an acronym and it stands for Scenario Accompanied Text-Based Iterative Evaluation of Automated Driving Functions. A bit long, therefore the, the acronym. Um, and I will show you in the next slides what it's all about. So first of all, as most of you probably will know, um, automated driving functions are one of the main current development and research topics. Um, customers, in our case, demand obviously availability, safety and extensive capabilities of such functions. Um, modern cars, therefore, include a vast numbers of sensors, the corresponding data sources and the actors. The complexity of such modern functions and their development is drastically increasing. One typical number which is always present is 40% more hardware and 400% more software per model series. And this is especially true regarding automated driving functions. Um, this leads to high cost and time pressure. Um, and that's why we need efficient processes and languages and tools. Um, obviously, a large portfolio of development methods and tools already exist, which have been developed throughout the last decades. Um, but those methods are no longer sufficient to face the complexity of the development of such modern driving functions. And that's why we need new, new methods or we have to extend the existing ones. Um, I'm talking about a scenario definition language, so therefore we first need to clarify what is a scenario, because the, the term is used for different things. Um, so a scene, in our case, uh, is a snapshot of the environment of the car or of the vehicle in general, and it's including the scenery and the dynamic elements, as well as all actors and observers' self-representations and the relationships among those entities. So I'm talking about the infrastructure, the road topology, but also the vehicles and their movement. Um, the scenario then is the temporary development between those scenes. So we have different points in time. They are called scenes. And then we have the scenario which is evolving through those scenes. Um, modern development processes for driving functions use such scenarios as accompanying artifacts, 
So those art uh, artifacts are present through the complete development process at a varying levels of, of abstraction. And one example for such a process is the scenario-based systems engineering process, SBSE. I've attached in the bibliography the link to that, so you can, can look it up if you want. Um, the V model, so as, as always, uh, we in the automotive industry are, are most, mostly focused on the V model. And there we have the uh, abstract scenarios, which are corresponding to the specification phase, phases. We have the logical scenarios, which are talking about the implementation of the system and the concrete scenarios, which are then for the testing and the validation and the verification. Important here is that the abstract, logical, and concrete scenarios vary regarding their usage, their format, and the included data. Now I, I already have used the terms functional, logical, and concrete, or abstract. Um, so a short information where those uh, terms are coming from. So there are different terminologies available in literature or in the industry, um, but for scenario descriptions for us, the following ones are relevant. So first of all, the abstraction levels according to Mara Bakshik. Um, those levels are three. So we are talking about a functional scenario, which is a semantic scenario description without any concrete values. So car one drives on the freeway behind of car two. A logical scenario uh, in, in, in instead is um, using parameter ranges. So for example, it's stating that car one drives with 80 to 90 kilometers per hour on a specific lane and with a specific distance of car two, but always parameter ranges. A concrete scenario on the other side is talking about concrete values. So it's choosing uh, concrete values directly out of those parameter ranges and is formulating the corresponding scenario description. One can see that the level of abstraction is, is declining, but on the other side, the number of scenarios is rising because obviously we can choose multiple combinations of, of concrete values out of the different parameter ranges and therefore we can generate uh, uh, multiple scenarios out of one logical scenario. For the rest of the talk, I will always use the term abstract scenario for a functional scenario. The reason is quite easy. In the automotive industry, we are always talking about function development. So if one reads functional scenario, it's always misleading for us. Therefore, I call it abstract scenario. The second thing is the five layer model of Reschka Schult. It's dividing the content of a scenario description in five layers. So it's talking about the street level, which includes the geometry and the topology. Um, level two is about the traffic infrastructure st structure. So we are talking about traffic signs, about barriers or whatever. Um, level three is about the temporal modification of level, level well, layer one and layer two. So it's typical construction sites, so to say. Uh, layer four is about movable objects. So here we are talking about pedestrians, animals, vehicles and also obstacles such as a stone because even a stone can be movable if we drive against it. Um, the last thing is the environment condition that is weather, the coverage of the of the road, day and time um, and so on. A small note, um, newer Pegasus publications contain an additional level, so uh, a layer. So for those of you who are familiar with the layers, there is also layer six, which is digital information. But that this layer is quite new and it's heavily disputed, so we left it out for now. So if we talk about the V model and the different phases of the development process, then we are using scenarios at different levels of abstraction, as already described. We are talking about a typical abstract scenario description. So, uh, so here uh, I have in a natural language text, I have described my scenario and also have a corresponding sketch. Um, in the implementation phase, I'm using a technical format uh, with the corresponding visualization mechanism. And on the concrete side, we have uh, also a technical format, which is then used within a simulation framework um, to run the tests and to, to improve the system. So if we look now at those different types of abstraction, we can see that they are varying in the levels of abstraction. And for example, for the process step of system specification, which is on our side typically used for the discussions with the stakeholders of the function or for documentation or for the specification of the behavior of the function, um, those are for uh, abstract scenarios. 
They are often incomplete, so they do not contain enough data to already run the simulation. They are using natural language because that even a, a non-technician can understand. Um, they are hardly machine readable because they are ambiguous. They can be written in with, with a spelling errors or whatever. Um, and they use a sketch as an aid. On the other side, there's, there's the process step of testing. And in this testing, we have concrete scenario description, which are fully specified. They are using a technical format. Um, they are machine readable for sure and they can be executed in the simulation. Different formats which can be transferred into one another exist, but they have to be transferred manually. And for concrete scenarios, we already have standardized formats. So probably some of you already know OpenCRG or Open Scenario or Open Drive. So those are open standards that can be used to describe such concrete scenarios. For abstract scenarios, on the other side, such a standardized format is still missing. So if we're talking about the creation of such, such an abstract scenario description, then we have the starting situation that we, uh, this is a manual step. So the specifier is sitting down and is, is writing the text manually. So in neither the textual description nor the visualization is standardized. He or she is using whatever is common in their environment, maybe following guidelines, maybe not following any guidelines, we cannot know. Um, the description and the visualization therefore are always inconsistent or often inconsistent. So, for example, uh, both uh, artifacts are contradictory or if I change one of them, then the other one won't change uh, uh, also automatically. It has, it has to be done manually and therefore the reuse of the data during the, de the development is problematic because if we go down to the implementation or even to the test side, then we have to add more information, which is quite difficult. Secondly, we are talking about multilingualism. So as you know, the automotive industry is getting more and more international, at least in Germany for us. So um, we are talking about multinational teams where English is the communication language. Um, the problem is that the scenario compre comprehension therefore depends on the individual language competence. So if one cannot really understand and read and write English at a certain level of quality, then we have a problem. Manual translations are possible for sure, but they are cumbersome and they are prone to errors and expensive also. Therefore, we currently have no automatic support of multilingualism. As third point, I will, we, we again talk about the levels of abstraction. So as you've seen, we need different levels of abstraction per process step. Uh, in some cases, a combination can also be, be, be present. So for example, I can include a concrete value for a speed limit, but I can leave the distance to the car in front of me uh, open. Available technical formats such as uh, Open Drive or Open Scenario can be used, but are hardly usable during the specification phase because they are quite difficult to read. They are mostly XML files, and XML files are cumbersome to write by hand. Um, scenarios at different levels of abstraction therefore have to be created manually in parallel. So um, we have defined a process which contains of eight steps. Um, this process includes uh, the different layers of uh, levels of abstraction here in our scenario catalog with the structure, the editors and ge the generators. So we are talking about generating stuff out of, out of the language other than Klaus before. Um, and the first step for us is to import already existing scenario descriptions. So as you can imagine, there are already many uh, document based scenario catalogs or uh, there are in any, any uh, table. Um, so we can import that by using parsing technologies such as natural language parsing. And then we, we have to merge those information that we parsed into our scenario catalog that is already present in our project. If everything is done, then the user has the, the ability to modify the scenario cat uh, catalog. So he can modify scenarios, he can add scenarios, he can remove some scenarios, whatever. And at a specific uh, point in time where he thinks, okay, now I'm ready. Now I can start the generation. He can generate the, necess and the necessary artifacts for the next development phases. And for example, the simulation scenario. This simulation, simulation scenario can then be put into the simulation. For this, additionally, 
obviously it's it's required to also have the system under test and so the test item and also the test cases so the test cases includes the concrete scenarios that were generated and the test criteria and metrics so what do i want to test then the simulation is run and i get my feedback um, the result is analyzed so here two options are possible so either um, my system behaved correctly according to specification, but the simulation failed anyway. Then I might have a problem in my simulation scenario. So I have to report it back to the next iteration and have to, has, have to rework in, uh, it in the scenario catalog so that the next simulation run will be successful. Or this, the system under test failed, then my scenario was correct but I have to, uh, to put it back into the test cases and into the system under test so that the, the system can be improved and in the next iteration it might be successful. So regarding the language grammar, if I want to incorporate multilingualism and the levels of abstraction in my language, um, I'm using here an extended Bacchus and Hour form to, to represent the grammar. And here it's quite easily readable that um, if I want to build a sentence with multiple natural languages, this grammar here supports that my car is overtaking, so car one is overtaking by car two, or it can also be used by PKW 1 wird von PKW 2 überholt, which is the German representation of that. And the same works for the abstraction levels. So if I use such a combined uh, grammar, I can use on a freeway, on a sunny day at 13 o'clock, vehicle one is located 30 meters behind of vehicle two and starts an overtaking maneuver. So as you can see, this grammar can be used to, to generate multiple different scenarios and to model multiple different scenarios. Obviously, that's a quite simple example. So it's only a very rough extract, for a very limited extract from our real uh, grammar. I will show it to you afterwards. But um, this is more or less an example of how this, this works. Both concepts, so both the one for multiple natural languages and the levels of abstraction are obviously combinable. Um, and we have done that. Uh, regarding the generation of the target artifacts for the uh, follow-up uh, development phases, so here is a simple uh, scenario description. You don't, you do not have to read that, but let's just assume that's the texture scenario description, and I also have obviously the underlying information model. And on the on the other side, I want my target artifact. So in this case, an open scenario export. So if I take here, for example, that a car at a specific position with a specific speed exists then the underlying model is containing that. We have the vehicle, we have that is a car, we have the speed, we have the position, and we can use that by using a generator to generate the corresponding vehicle and the corresponding uh, uh, maneuver. The developed solution, Steve in MPS, has several key features, obviously. The, de the definition of the domain model for freeway freeways uh, has been done in MPS uh, with support for multiple countries. So currently it's limited to China, the US and Germany, which are quite different. Um, the specification of the editors for the natural language uh, to reflect the syntax of each language has been done. Currently um, it's German, English and Chinese. Um, the incorporation of the defined Pegasus abstraction levels and the content layers have been done. So if I go down here, so here is my la layer one, which is the road topology, I have la the layer two, which is traffic infrastructure, then the temporal changes, then the uh, object definition and the maneuvers, and last but not least, the, um, the uh, environment conditions. We also have implemented a visualization framework, which is capable of visualizing the scenario content. And we have implemented the generators for different artifacts. So currently it's limit to, limited to Microsoft Office, image uh, to certain image formats, uh, JSON files, and Open Drive and Open Scenario. So this is a screenshot directly out of the tool, and I will directly jump into the tool and model that. So here you can see the scenario description, and you can see the corresponding uh, visualization. And if I jump now into my tool, here it is. So here you can see it live. So here is a new scenario catalog. Um, 
it's uh, in English and we have a preview and we have certain layers. So here is again the road model layer, then the uh, layer two, three, four, five of the Pegasus model and uh, an additional scenario co uh, control, which is not important for now. So I will unfold them. So what I always do if I start, so here we are talking about a scenario in Germany on a freeway. The first scenario that I want to model is quite a simple sunny day scenario, which just shows the workflow. So I'm using here um, a new segment. A segment is part of the street. Um, it contains, uh, uh, so it's, it, it has a certain geometry and it contain, contains a certain number of driving lanes. In addition, I can add here um, a certain lane. So I can add here, for example, a stop lane. So we have here now this, the stop lane as representation. And in addition, I can add on layer two, I can add some infrastructure information. So for example, the information that we are talking about guideposts. So the street get, gets guideposts and also uh, equipments. So guardrails, for example. Um, I then go, so I would just fold this and this to have some space. I define here a new vehicle group. So, um, and in this vehicle group, we obviously need some vehicles. So first of all, I want to define a truck. This truck um, has trailer and it's located on driving lane number two. So now we have the truck. And in addition, we want to use a car. Car and this car drives behind of truck one. So we have different assistants and different uh, uh, wizards that assist you with modeling that. I know what uh, what uh, uh, square means what, so where to find what, but we have some assistance and some documents about that to help a new, a new user. So I define here a new car. And one thing that I do here is I switch it to ego mode. So currently uh, every car is the same, but if I'm talking about an automated driving function that, I'm want, that I want to, to view the scenario from a specific point of view, and that's the one from the ego vehicle. So I'm defining that it's an ego. And now I'm going from, it is doing something to it shall do something. So it drives behind of the truck and also I go here to my maneuver description. So here I would say that the um, I will do three phases, phase one, phase two, phase three. And phase one would be um, that the ego car is assisted and shall um, change. To, so that's a lateral maneuver change to the next lane. And my truck is doing a braking maneuver until standing. The second maneuver would be that my ego car is accelerating. I would do it strongly until a high speed is reached and my truck just stands and my ego car is driving and my truck is again accelerating. So now I've modeled a, a certain scenario and I can, oh, I have so, so small information. No, I have no information for layer five. So this will be the content of the next scenario. So here you can see that is a lane change maneuver. That is a, a deceleration maneuver. That's why the arrow is red. And what we can do now is first of all, we can click through the faces. So you can see that first of all, the car is changing the lane, the truck is standing and then the truck is accelerating and again, and the, the ego vehicle is driving. So though this is a rough visualization. So it's not a simulation, it's a visualization that is just calculating the next positions of the individual vehicles. Um, the second thing that I can do here um, is I can switch the levels of abstraction. So as, I, as I've, uh, I've uh, explained before, um, I can go to from the abstract level here, I can go to the logical level. So on the logical level, you will see that before I was talking about a high speed that should be reached. 
Now I'm talking about two to three three meters per second squared. So that's uh, that's uh, the the underlying parameter range, and I also have a specified default parameter, so two dot two dot o. And that's done for for every parameter that can have a value. So also here the speed that can be reached, the acceleration. So that's done for everything. You can even specify here something for yourself. So if you, for example, decide, yeah, I don't like this default value of 2.2.2.0, I just want to switch it to 3.0, you can do that. Then a small lock symbol appears. And if I switch back to abstract, then the uh, last value is uh, again switched to high. But the first value will remain because I have specifically specifically chosen to use 3.0. So that is the first scenario. And I want to show you one more. And if we still have time, I have a third one, but we will see. Um, so the second one is a bit more complex one. It's the one that I have shown you in the screenshot in the presentation. For this, I also need a segment um, and I need a second segment. So I will just add another segment. The first um, contains um, five driving lanes. So I have to go here and choose five driving lanes. Um, then I also want to choose that my lane number four has, a, what's wrong? has the left marking as a continuous so we are going here from from uh, interrupted to continuous um, and the second would be so the second would be that my lane number five has a widening to the right lane so it's going here and also I want to switch the position of my widening. So uh, uh, give me a second on the left. Okay, that's strange. Ah, okay, I was in the wrong, li uh, wrong line. Okay, it's here at the beginning. Here it is. So here we have our widening. And uh, as next step, I will uh, model here my second thing. So I have here, first of all, I have here my my um, three lanes, and I also want to model an exit from the freeway. And this exit requires two lanes to work. Um, then I want to add some information here about the infrastructure. So first of all, regarding the um, the infrastructure of the first segment, it's uh, leading under a bridge. Secondly, I also want to uh, model that I have guideposts and I want to model that I have guardrails and I have pillars. Just pop that out again. So we are talking about this one. So it's pillars for the bridge and guardrails. Um, then I want to model that I have um, at the beginning, there is a sign group. The sign group consists of a traffic sign of type regulation with sign type speed limit 100 kilometers per hour. So it's just the one here. Um, and for the second segment, I want to do um, that. Uh, I want to give some information about my main roadway. I would also have guardrails. Um, and I want to have additional, some noise barriers here. Um, and I want to have some traffic regulations. So here I want to have a bridge. And this bridge contains a variable traffic signs of type regulation. And the sign time would be speed limit. Then I will do another one, traffic regulation, variable traffic sign, definition, regulation sign type speed limit and one last one traffic sign so regulation of sign type speed limit so now i have my three three traffic signs and then can go to um, the layer three so in layer three i want to model a small blockage so like a small construction site 
So I would say that here my impact on road is a short term construction site and my impact on lane is that the lane number one is, is blocked. So now I have here a blockage. In layer four, I want to model vehicle groups. Um, so first of all, I, I want to have two vehicle groups. So I will add here one additional group. Um, then I was wrong. Subject. Okay, that is really strange. Ah, okay, I have to go segment here. Segment two. So here it is a vehicle one and vehicle two. I again want to have a truck. I want to have a car and the third the third um, subject would just remain as abstract vehicle. So I do not want to specify my type of vehicle. Um, the truck again has a trailer and it drives on driving lane number three. Car two is located um, left of my truck. So I want to go here for left in front of my truck and my vehicle three is um, located in number five. And I want to say at the end. Um, and the second group consists of two vehicles. So first of all, my bus. And second of all, my motorcycle. The bus drives on um, driving lane number three and my motorcycle drives left of bus four, left of bus four. My maneuvers are only two in this case, so I want to have two phases. First of all, I want to say, state that the motorcycle accelerates and and simultaneously I want that my uh, vehicle drive uh, vehicle 3 decelerates vehicle 3 decelerates and simultaneously I want that my car 2 um, does a lateral change maneuver. So I have to change this to car two. Again, conflicting with the small window resolution. Here it is. And it does a lane change to the nearest right lane. Um, and in the second phase, I'm talking about the car two that it uh, accelerates strongly. Um, last but not least, I also can modify some information about the infrastructure. So here uh, I could add the information that takes uh, part at afternoon. Um, it, it is done in summer and it is under clear conditions, for example. Um, and for uh, regarding the weather, I have here for the information that, for example, that my that the rain falls and I can also specify the type of precipitation. I could do some road coverage and what, whatsoever. So now I have formulated the complete scenario. It's the one that has been, been uh, presented in the slide. I can also do here obviously those maneuvers. Um, and what I can do additionally is we have used different types of views, for example, to do a tabulate as, as table. So as you can imagine, many of the scenario catalogs are either in Word or in Excel, and in Excel we have a table. Therefore, we are representing the information also in table. You can still specify here the scenario. Um, I personally like the text view, but table view is also possible. Now we come to one of the biggest advantages of that approach. Um, as I've presented you in the slides, it uses those this combined uh, grammar that means that we are uh, that we have embedded the syntax of different natural languages directly in in Steve. That means if I now switch from English to German, then I have directly the uh, syntact syntactically correct German description of the scenario. 
And the same is true for Chinese. So if I go to Chinese, then you have, there's a small bug. We have, <laughs> we have noticed that today, but it's the Chinese description of the scenario. So you can just use and model the scenario in whatever uh, language you are used to. And then the reader of this scenario just has to change the description to the language that he knows best. And he can understand the scenario description, use it, modify it, whatever. Um, one additional thing that I want to show is we also have some generators, as I, as I said before. So I would just add them here. So I'll go for export. Take some time. Now it is here. So what we've done here is as export. So first of all, quite obvious, it's the word export. So it's just the visualization and the corresponding text description um, using a predefined template. So we can modify the fonts, we can modify the header, we can add, uh, add logos, whatever. So we can just create the scenario catalog in Word, Word uh, which, which would be normally written in Word. So that's that's the thing. Um, and secondly, we have the Excel export. So here are our two scenarios as Excel. We have here a small scaling problem again, but you can imagine how it should look like. Um, we are also using uh, images as output. So we are using here this PNG images. Um, and we are using two technical formats. I would say, first of all, we are using RecIF um, to be uh, to be able to import the scenario description and the scenario catalog into doors, for example, or into any other requirements management tool which supports RecIF. Um, and the second technical format would be JSON. So JSON is our format which consists all of the underlying information from the information model and uh, which then is used in our internal non-open cloud solution uh, to generate the open drive and open scenario files directly out of this. Um, Marcus has, told, has, has written me that I should not show the, the third scenario due to time issues, but what I still want to show, and I can do it quite briefly, um, is one thing and Florian, I've talked, yeah, Florian, it's fine if you show a third example, but I'd, I'd suggest if you have it prepared, we can definitely look at it. But watching you type for 10 minutes yeah, is, yeah. is not the greatest entertainment. So that's that, but that was sure. my comment <laughs> for sure. And then let All me right. just open the yeah, we have time. Uh, yeah, let me just open the uh, other project. This is the same thing that I modeled today, but already complete. So the third um, scenario would be this one. So this one is placed currently in Germany. Um, and we have we are having a, a parallel road with with an exit. We're having some road coverage. So um, here is it's covered by ice. We have vegetation, we have certain vehicles and also we have here one specific element which is not possible in german so in, in in germany so in germany we don't have this specific element but we do have it in china or in the us so you can directly switch from from the most left lane of the freeway to the most left lane of the opposite side and if i switch now you can just watch the road markings and also watch the traffic sign here. And I will switch here from Germany to China. Then you will notice that the remote road markings have, have changed a little bit. And if I switch to US, it becomes more obvious. So I, we are switching, uh, de depending on the country, we are switching the, uh, the visualization. So you are getting the road markings that you would see in the country. And also we are we are using the corresponding traffic signs. And so we are just exchanging the corresponding images so that the user can define the information that is necessary. And one additional thing that I can still show is that we also have more country specific elements. For example, we have here a lane that is called HOV lane. That's a typical element in the US. 
Um, it's high occupancy vehicle lane, so it's a lane that's specifically reserved for vehicles which contain a minimum amount of passengers. And if I add one here, then you will see here the specific lane with the corresponding uh, uh, shapes that are on the road and this corresponding road marking so that is also possible. So those are country specific elements that are not possible in Germany but which are possible in other countries and we try to support them. We are already on a good road there to for, for the uh, US and for China. Um, for other countries, uh, countries we, we have not started that yet. I will jump for two or three more slides back to the to the slides. So what are the big advantages of our, our uh, presentation uh, of our language? First of all, um, the scenario descriptions are un unambiguous. We are defining the syntax and we are, we are, the user has to use the syntax. So it's unambiguous. The support, the user is supported in the creation of the scenario because he just has to click through and click all those patterns together, which is quite fast, but has to, has to be prepared. Um, the embedding of the grammar of multiple lang natural language in Steve allows this multilingualism that I was talking about without the necessity of manual translations. The generated artifacts on the other side can be used directly in the following development steps. Obviously, there are also limitations. So we have restricted syntax and semantics. That means you cannot write free text. That's a bit limiting for the user. So the user has to get used to the language. And sometimes he might have to rephrase things that he otherwise would have just written how he was used to. So that's a limitation. And the quality of the scenario description obviously is depending on the quality of the language. So the better the language Steve is, the better the outcome from this narrow catalog would, would be. So that's a maintenance effort for us. As short outlook, so um, currently extension to support park uh, to support parking and roundabout as domain are already implemented, so they have been finished. Um, extensions for uh, rural and urban roads are scheduled for this and the next year. Um, more supported natural languages, you have already seen it in the tool that we have started with with Russian, but more language will be addressed uh, in the future. Um, and the public availability, so that's one critical point of Steve is currently being addressed. So we are planning to release the tool uh, as freeware, so not open source, but freeware. Um, but it's currently investigated by our, by our legal department. So just to clarify all IP stuff. Um, some development related findings. So um, uh, concrete scenarios exist as complete scenarios, that's for sure. Otherwise, they won't be executable in the simulation. But for logical and functional abstract scenarios, they are mostly incomplete. So it's uh, uh, the abstraction levels will be mixed. Uh, they are incomplete. That's one finding. Then some default parameter values may be different for different domains. So for example, uh, uh, normal speed in the parking domain means something else than on, on a freeway. And the abstraction from vehicle trajectories, which are normally used in simulation to maneuvers can be difficult. The variation and the generation for that are on the other side needed because again, the simulation need the trajectory. So if we abstract them to maneuvers, then we have to have any mechanism to go back to trajectories by generation. In general, the restricted syntax is limiting the user again, but it's uh, enforcing the unambiguity. Um, the grammar structure, for example, for of German uh, includes various challenges, e.g. E e the articles, that's for sure. Um, the support of Unicode characters works quite well. As you have seen the Chinese translation, it's where it works well. Um, and we have identified because we are always struggling with administrator rights and installation of tools. We have packaged the MPS with an, with an portable open JDK distribution and the language, and it works quite fine. It's just a zip file. You can unzip it and run it. You don't need any administrator rights or in installation. That's quite nice. Um, we have certain open issues of regarding JetBrains MPS that we currently want to address somewhere in the future. First of all, I, I know on Wednesday there was already a talk about this uh, web MPS. That was uh, would be a tremendous help for us because obviously then we can just get rid of any local installation. We can just use it via web. Um, 
Multilingualism, so we are able to support scenario descriptions at different languages. And I know that at some point in the past on the roadmap of JetBrains, there was the, the translation of the of MPS itself to different languages. We are still hoping for that. Um, the migration scripts, so we have sometimes some tr uh, troubles with the migration scripts if something was not uh, uh, so they are executed every migration script is executed by uh, by the migration assistant and that's leading to some problems but that's more a technical point and last but not least the user interface workflow that's a quite funny point um so the shortcuts described in the interface and also in the in the user guide does not work on german keyboard layout because the the brackets are on other keys and they just don't work so just as a, as a short remark I've brought here uh, uh, the bibliography so you can look it up for yourself. Um, and that's the end of my presentation and of the live demonstration. I'm open for questions. We still have 20 minutes left, so quite some room for, for questions. And if you are interested in the tool, just contact me via this email. And now I hand over to Markus. Exactly. Thank you very much for the talk. Um, quite impressive stuff, especially the fact that the visualization is maintained kind of in, in real time. I'll, I'll start with um, two questions about that. First of all, maybe you'd have said, you've said it and I was distracted with collecting questions, but the visualizer, you, you did not build that yourself, did you? Or was that already we, we available? Did. You no, did? That's, that's, that's a visualization that we wrote wow. ourselves. So we... Uh, we're struggling very much with curved roads and with uh, the proper alignment of every every segment and every lane. Um, for freeways, it works quite well until now. For um, parking garages, it's currently still under development. We hope to finish that until March, um, mm -hmm. because there, obviously, due due to this very very compact. Uh, road topology with all those different parking spaces and walls and barriers and whatever it's it gets quite complex to manage that from a visualization point of view yeah. but we are optimistic and it looks like uh, looks just promising so we'll see Klaus was asking a question in that in that space uh, can you model crossroads and roundabouts and special stuff like departing ferries <laughs> <laughs> so uh, regarding um, regarding uh, roundabouts, yes, we can already model roundabouts. There, the visualization is still incomplete, so we already have the possibility. If I jump jump here back, um, you can just look. If I add another scenario and I just jump to the top element, you can see here that we are uh, mm -hmm. possible. Uh, we are able to do a parking garage. We are able to do a, a roundabout. The visualization is not complete, as I said. It will be done on, uh, during during March or April, um, but then we can do that. Uh, regarding ferry, no, <laughs> not yet. <laughs> so ferry would be one point for the uh, for the urban um, urban road. So we are already defining the language for that from the from the grammar definition. The implementation MPS is the next step. So we are hoping yeah. to finish the uh, rural and urban roads until end of this year. I'm sure there is some kind of open source shipping simulator that you could integrate. Um, For sure. <laughs> Vladislav asks, uh, are scenarios always deterministic? Are there any randomized behavior or changing weather conditions in this system? Um, so you can define changing weather conditions. So regarding that example, if you define here uh, environment conditions, you can do here segment conditions and on segment conditions, now I just have to use a scenario where anything is mm -hmm. modeled. Um, so here mm -hmm. I do a segment condition and here in the segment I can, could specify, for example, that hail falls. Mm -hmm. And for example, here I, in, in the face, I can even spe specify that in the face, the weather is changing. Mm -hmm. So there is now, um, for example, the visualization range is strongly reduced. So there we have some kind of dynamic behavior regarding the vehicles. It's deterministic, mm -hmm. but, and there's a limitation, uh, when we are talking about the ego car, it's here stated as shell language. Mm -hmm. So it shall do that. There, the simulation will obviously put in the system under test and the corresponding code that lies underneath, and then he, he, it will execute it. So there is some kind of, Mm -hmm. randomization due to the implementation that can yep. happen 
one thing that we also do, and that's a thing that I, that I said before regarding the cloud solution. So this is, we call that a specification scenario because it uses um, information at different levels of abstraction. And right. this information is then taken to the cloud where it's, where it's uh, generated and converted into concrete scenarios in open drive and open scenario. And there variation and parameterization will happen. So you're basically expanding the abstract scenario into a whole range or family or variation yes. space of concrete scenarios that are then executed. Yeah, we, we are just general. So for example, if I'm if I'm talking about a distance of 80 to 120 kilometer uh, uh, meters, mm -hmm. the distance, mm -hmm. um, then in the in the cloud, the, uh, this parameter range will be varied. So either by using a distribution function or by using yep. stepwise or by using randomization or whatever. And right. then multiple concrete scenarios will be generated, which will be automatically executed in the simulation. But you have no scenario generator on this level that explores no. uh, options. Okay, that was a no. question by close. Uh, no, one that's, question. that's a manual process here right. because yeah. at the end of the day, we are trying to replace Word, so to say. Right. So yeah, the user is in word. charge. Yeah. Yes. Um, one question that I, for myself, that I, I'm struggling with in understanding, if you generate this range of scenarios on the level down below then for execution in the simulator, how do, what's the point? How do you determine whether the, the scenario was scenario was executed successfully? I mean, is this like a test case that can fail or not fail? Or is the car no, just it, driving to exercise? W what is the goal? So the goal here is to describe the environment. So it's like the environment conditions where the system developed will be in. So okay. you always okay. need the scenario description. You need the test case description, which will describe what will ha what should happen. One part okay. of that is this this uh, ego shell behavior language here. So it's a sub language, yeah. and but it's not limited to that because obviously we also have test cases regarding the internal behavior, so bus system signals and and stuff like that. So that's also part of the test case. And then we need the system under test, and those three things together then mm -hmm. really uh, build the test and they are executed in the simulation. So the scenario itself, you can execute it, but the only thing that you will see is that uh, the, the vehicles are moving, but there yeah. is nothing to test. There is no right. success criteria. Okay, exactly. That was my question. So now I understand. Yes. It. So Julian asks, are the Word and Excel outputs generated, generated via an existing template or plugin, or did you have to write them themselves? Or how did you do that technically? We are using Document4j. So that's an open like an framework. API for Microsoft Office. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. It's, it's right. uh, the, the convenient uh, thing about uh, document for j is that you do not have an, an uh, existing installation of Microsoft Office. So it runs out of the box mm -hmm. just without any Office installation. And it just pushes out the, the files for Word and PowerPoint and Excel and whatever. All right. That's quite convenient. Mm -hmm. Sebastian asks, apart from language translation, do you also do unit conversion? when you change from, uh, let's say, Germany to the US or to China? Yes, um, we do that. So uh, obviously this imperial to metric system thing is always yeah. a thing there. Um, we are doing that internally, but it's currently not visualized correctly. So that's a thing that we are currently working on. We also hope to, to finish that until March because then our visualization project will end, which has, has done the, a great rework of the initial visualization. So we had a first implementation and that was a bit limited. So mm -hmm. we uh, reworked it and this will, it will be done until the end of March. And then we will hopefully already have uh, uh, the the uh, migration between um, um, miles per hour and kilometers mm -hmm. per hour and all those things. Okay. Did you have to learn Chinese to do the translations or did the colleague do uh, that? <laughs> the, uh, specific colleague. So I personally, okay. I cannot read Chinese, okay. but we have a colleague on our side uh, and we have multiple testers on the tester side, which are able mm -hmm. to read Chinese. So they are testing this and giving feedback. So it's an HR development process anyway. Right. Years ago, I wrote a book which was translated to Chinese and they Oof. kindly sent me the book for proofreading. I declined. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> True. So another question by Julian. I assume you're generating outputting multiple files. Yes, you showed that. Uh, I need advice on how to do this. Um, I only seem to be able to create one XML file for my language, but I want to uh, uh, split it into several files. Can you give maybe him a two minute primer on how to generate multiple files? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I don't think that I need two minutes because I can't go into the code right now due to 
closed source issues um, so I can't show you that um, but the point is I think if you can only uh, generate one file it sounds like you're using the text generator because that pushes out only one file from my point of view per node um, yeah per node yes um, so uh, we have initially tried uh, used the normal generator concept of uh, MPS uh, but we have changed that um, and we are using uh, behaviors and in the behaviors we are just writing the files mm -hmm. okay so that's the thing where we are just using basically java techniques to write the files mm -hmm. that's a bit of uh, going around mps techniques because we are not really using the generators maybe it will be used in the future but for now we are sticking with, to that okay so a question that i had and which then is followed on by one uh, by one from close um, so the natural language, you've basically encoded the natural language grammar of the various languages for yes. the various kinds of sentences you're interested in yes. as specific concepts with subconcepts and slots where to put them. Yes, exactly. So we have the concepts in, in MPS, which, which represent the information model. And we have the editors and there's an editor for Chinese, there's an editor for English, there's an editor mm -hmm. for whatever. And additionally, we have so-called attribute tables and we are using that to map the different attributes so that for the abstract layer, we I'm talking about a normal width. For the logical layer, I'm talking about uh, uh, 80 to 120 meters. And for the concrete level, I'm talking about 95 mm. meters mm. so those mm. are attribute tables and we are just accessing them so if i switch here the abstraction level then what is done in mm -hmm. the background is uh, the the uh, the editor is changed and also the uh, underlying attribute tables are changed okay all right so here is the question by close could this multi-language support based on these combined grammars be extracted and used by other mps based tools for example uh, could it be open sourced in the mps extensions uh, assuming legal uh, allows it to do yeah, yeah so so the basic concept of that is already published because i've uh, published it in my in my uh, doctoral thesis so it can just be found by using my name in the internet and it's also in the bibliography uh, regarding the implementation i think it might be extractable but i don't know when or how we will do it because legal mm. things yeah. i don't know nothing about that um, but I think it could be, uh, but the basic concept can definitely be adapted. I mean, at the end of the day, it's no magic. You, you're just uh, combining the different syntaxes in the, uh, in, yeah. in the, in the editors. And yeah. you are, obviously there are 1 million edge, edge cases and border cases yeah. that you have to, to do and where you have to, yeah, here you need, you need to, to use your verb and here you have to adjust it yeah. and stuff yeah. like that. So in English, it's quite nice. Uh, in yeah. German, it's difficult and we are going now to Russian and that's, yeah. <laughs> you can probably get support from JetBrains. <laughs> <laughs> probably, yes. <laughs> All right. Uh, I think that's it. We have no more questions. Thanks again. Um, very interesting uh, roundup of the of the of the of the second day. Cool. Thank you. Okay, uh, everybody. This brings us to the end of today. I just briefly want to uh, mention one more thing. Um, Daniel Ratziu has built a tool called Fasten. It's a model checking and safety analysis tool on top of MPS. He didn't present obviously this week. But uh, he will present on, I think, February 5th, uh, 17 uh, during Itemis' webcast. So if you're interested in more MPS-based systems engineering tools, um, Google for that or ping me. Uh, that, should be, that should be interesting as well. Okay. So this concludes the whole week. Um, I'm, I have to say I'm, I'm really happy with how it went. Um, the talks were interesting. They gave a really great overview over what people do both in terms of domains and in terms of how mps is used we we learned about mps uh, sorry about community activities like web mps or model x or web edit kit and stuff as a moderator i'm quite happy that all the talks finished in time so we had time for questions the questions were also really good so thank you to all the uh, all you guys in the audience for asking questions so personally i might be a little bit biased but i think uh, it was a good week it showed uh, the liveness and 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 enthusiasm of the community, and um, yeah, 
I'm sure we're going to do this again. And don't forget to uh, like uh, the video if you enjoyed today and maybe go back to the videos from the previous days and enjoy and <laughs> like those too. All right. Thank you. Thanks to JetBrains for organizing. That's it. Enjoy the rest of the weekend or enjoy the weekend and uh, talk to you, I don't know, next year. Ciao.